Keith. I am so grateful to have you on my show. Thank you so much for coming. Can you please tell us a little bit about who you are and the work you're doing? Yeah, thanks for having me, Tanya. So I'm Keith and I work doing psychedelic integration coaching, which is helping people prepare for uh, psychedelic experiences, helping people integrate the experiences, which is to bring the meaningful um, and actionable aspects of it into their normal reality. Um, and to understand, you know, the, to the extent that it's understandable, the psychedelic experiences that they're having, which can be very jarring or destabilizing or um, confusing because there's so much going on. It's so foreign to our normal daily experience. And especially people without experience in that domain, um, it, you know, it's, it's so foreign, it's so different that it can be really helpful to have some guidance to help understand uh, what is it that I really can, what's the most that I can get out of this? Because there's, there's always so much to get out of it. Mm -hmm. I think that even with just using the word integration, it's not nearly enough to talk about how many different levels of meaning integration actually has. It's like you can define it on so many different levels of our waking consciousness. Do you find that true? I mean, because it feels like on a larger scale, it can, it's something, okay, this is where I'm trying to go. It yeah. feels like with plant medicine, psychedelics, on a larger scale, it really wants to work with you. And, but it wants to work with you if you're willing to work with it. Like, are you ready to step up hand in hand? Like it's a complete joint effort. So on one hand, it seems like you have integration on that spectrum. And then on the other, it goes down to a spectrum of just everyday life and um, living in more grace, which I just, I have to say, I've always wanted more grace in my life. And I didn't ever think it was possible. And this is where we're starting to see a huge shift with grace and flow. Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing that as well in my own life and in the unfolding of this whole psychedelic renaissance that's happening. And I think you're right to speak to the, the, um, you know, the spectrum that integration can exist on. Because really, I I think at the highest levels, it's the work of life is to integrate ourselves to bring all of the aspects of ourselves into harmonious orbit. And that, that is the work of life. It, it's the work that takes a lifetime. And so the, the psychedelic integration is, you know, uh, maybe a microcosm of that or one aspect of that where we're integrating these numinous experiences into our being. Um, and I love what you're saying, too, about the idea of integrating with the medicine itself. And because it is, it's, it's a dance. It's, you really have to allow yourself to, to dance with it, to, to flow in the river and not try to paddle in the other direction. And because you'll get capsized, um, it's, it, it can be extremely overpowering if you're not allowing yourself to move fluidly with the experience so it really is you're integrating yourself with the medicine what it is trying to show you and what you are opening yourself up to be receptive to um and yeah it's it, it really can be and should be a beautiful dance so um you know i started this podcast about transformation and you know, it really led me to um, asking a lot of people who are doing work in the psychedelic realm because there's nothing been, I, mean, I haven't discovered anything as um, fast, rapid, um, as incredible as what can happen in this, in this realm. Uh, what I wanted to 
kind of break down for people because I think it sounds a little bit large for some people that haven't um, been introduced to this subject. Can we talk a little bit about um, the changes that it, it may ask you to do or may you may need to step up into in regards to healthy eating, in regards to the relationships in, in our lives and in regards to the work we do? Yeah, yeah, so. And you can also use like examples of maybe stuff that you've seen because I know we're all so unique. It's like we're all such unique soups and there's definitely that difference there. Yes, yeah, right. And it, it can run a, a full gamut of some people, you know, I talked to a client recently who had an experience and he said, he came back from it and he said, okay, I'm done drinking. And he didn't have necessarily a, a, what he considered a problem with drinking, but he just came back with that understanding that at this time in my life, this is not something that I need to have in my life. And so some things happen just instantly like that. It's just kind of a, a switch flips over and you no longer want to participate in this behavior that previously you've been participating in. Um, some things, it points you to deeper work to be done. Um, maybe a conversation that you need to have or an opening of a door of forgiveness that it's going to take a lot to be able to step through. And so it, it really does run the gamut of some things are just, you know, kind of instantaneous transformations, um, especially with things like cessation of particular vices. But some things are just a kind of an arrow pointing you to this is the deeper work to be done. And that work, you know, can take, who knows, months, years, or a lifetime. And that's okay, too. There's, you know, some people, I think, anticipate that, oh, I'm going to have this experience. And I want all of these aspects of my life to change. Um, I want to, you know, start eating perfectly clean and treating my body right and exercising X times a week and, you know, being a better father or mother or whatever it may be. And I've seen some people become kind of disappointed when there isn't that switch that's just instantaneously flipped. And again, that can happen and it can happen mysteriously and miraculously. And it does happen, but it's also not, I wouldn't say it's the norm because a lot of the stuff that the psychedelics bring up is the really deep stuff that's reaching back all the way to your, your deepest self. And so is requiring of you a much greater efforting to, to integrate. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And it's also kind of beautiful that it is um, mysterious because we ourselves internally are just so mysterious. Um, I really love how it's happening that way. So I wanted to share a couple things. Um, one, I found in myself a few instantaneous things of um, recurring thought processes at night that I couldn't release lifted instantaneously, never I, um, I would have this thought where I would go to bed and I'd be like, am I a good person? And I have to, and I'm like, why am I even thinking this? And, you know, it goes back from patterning from childhood, gone. It was gone. It was amazing. Also, what I found was um, when I was talking about relationships, I really noticed for the first time in my life, a complete understanding of who matters, who I adore, who I love, and who, do, and who just, I don't need to have anywhere near my orbit. And that was just so amazing how quickly that happened. Yeah, that, that piece about relationships and really love, for me, every time I go to the psychedelic space, love is 
one of the deepest and most prominent themes. And so that that sort of stuff really can happen and, and often does happen very deeply where you are really remembering how much you care for certain people and how much that your presence matters to them and their presence matters to you. And also, like you're saying, uh, situations or relationships that, you know, aren't actually healthy for you or don't require as much attention as you're giving to it or things that can, that you can let fall away. So that's cool to hear you speak on those things. Yeah. And I, I'm really excited to talk about love because I feel like what I'm noticing as, um, I don't think people understand, you know, we had a big wave of how important gratitude work was. And I don't think people really understand how important gratitude work is. I feel like um, gratitude has, has this equivalent with a deeper trust. And if we spend our lifetime doing gratitude work, I feel like, you know, we move through psychedelic experiences easier, but we will also move through death a lot easier. Now, that being said, I have to tell you, I'm married to a man who's almost on the spectrum. He has no ability to be grateful at all, zero. He has never in his life, maybe once or twice, been able to share a gratitude statement with me. And so, and he's been um, on a microdosing regimen and um, what it's doing for him, he's such a mathematic guy. It's only increasing his math skills. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just like, so I don't know where, the gratitude, the ability for people to work with gratitude matters. And then the people who just don't, do you have any insight there? That's really interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the case of your husband and <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's, it is humorous to think about that. It's just helping him mathematically and who knows, <laughs> maybe it is helping him right. with the gratitude as well. And he's, working his way up to finding the words to express it. Um, but I think the how you're highlighting how important gratitude is, I think I, I agree with. And um, I, I understand gratitude as being the opposite of resentment and that these two forces can't exist in the same space. And that resentment is one of the most dangerous forces that exist in the human emotional spectrum and it's something that we're having to deal with a lot right now personally internally and also just societally at large we see resentment playing out in so many ways and how destructive it it is and can be and i think gratitude is the you could say antidote for that or the kind of easing back into that loving space um, through because, you know, of course, there's so many things to be upset and angry with and um, feel sorrow for so, so many. And there's, there's so many things to really be grateful for and so much beauty and so much love and so many people who are doing good work in you know lifting the human spirit and so i think you're exactly right that there's always more we can do to help gratitude kind of rise to the forefront that is so phenomenal that you said that that gratitude is the opposite of resentment can you tell us uh, how you came upon that particular understanding because it it seems like a juicy one <laughs> yeah i i'm not sure i can recall where that comes from or how i came to that i know that um i have been really interested in the the concept the idea of resentment and it's something that why how did um, you get that interest in the beginning part of it was through reading um Nietzsche the philosopher and he he speaks about resentment and the dangers of it a lot um and part of it was seeing it in myself and the ways that I felt it was deteriorating me 
And part of it was seeing it in the, the world at large, the culture, and seeing how deleterious that force is in, in, in our world. And I think the, the other part of it would be doing the psychedelic work because, like I said, every time I enter that space, the message is love and interconnection and resentment is kind of the opposite of, of that situation. And it's something that I think that our world doesn't acknowledge enough that we get trapped in this way of operating. Um, and the, in, in such a way that it not only is deterior, deteriorating the cultural fabric, but it's deteriorating something deep within ourselves and just spending enough time thinking about it. And particularly in the psychedelic space where that love, that interconnectedness is the prime force um, really helped me see how those things are kind of in opposition and how we can really shift things radically by stepping further into the love, the love side of things. So in your work, have you been to a place to where you were able to understand resentment? Cause it feels like such a, a great theme for you and the work that you do. Were you able to get to a place to where you love that as human beings, we actually get to experience resentment so that we can shed it? That's beautiful, Tanya. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really kind of the, the next level of it. That's really beautiful, beautifully put and beautifully understood. I think that, yeah, you know, it's, I think shame is another of the major forces that are at play in, in the human psyche and again, in the culture at large right now. And so if we can not put shame on ourselves for our resentment, we can not put shame on ourselves for other people's resentment, then that is going to make it so much easier to release. And exactly what you said, like even loving that we have the capacity for resentment, because that is also, it is if, if we've been betrayed or we've been hurt or traumatized or whatever it is that that resentment serves a function that is important. So yeah, I think that's just so beautifully said and important to bring up that we can love even the aspects of ourselves that we might deem the most dark. Wow. Have you worked with, uh, I'm just curious, I'm just getting, um, I just feel called to ask this. Have you worked with people that have been in prison long-term or? No, I haven't. And I, I haven't at all. And I would love to. And I think that that is an area where psychedelics could play a hugely healing role. But yeah, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, well, I have a lot of things going on in my head right now. Uh, I guess one of the forefront one is at the psychedelic realm, the field, it makes you move into the moment. And I think that what's been most surprising in my own discoveries is how the thought of what everybody else thinks of you isn't a reality, that that isn't in the moment at all. So um, you were talking about shame and I was thinking, hmm, I wonder what the difference between shame and, and um, shame is. But then I was like, you know, the confidence in landing in ourselves is so uh, extraordinary in the, in the moment, you know? Yes. And I think that's exactly right. And that's another of these pairings that I've been trying to figure out or formulate is shame and flow are actually opposites. Wow. And so you're, you, you just touched wow. on that so, so perfectly. It's like when we are in a state of flow, 
which is really us inhabiting our highest selves, then shame can't enter the equation. And so that, yeah, exactly what you said, I think is, is exactly accurate. So um, f- for me, I'm experiencing, you know, we have a, uh, sometimes we have a pre-planned um, plan and that's not flow. <laughs> flow is, is trust. Flow is handing it over. I'm curious about your own spiritual um, path now. Are you feeling more and more spiritual, like in the way of handing your life over? I would say so. Yeah, I would say so. I would say the more steps I take down the path that I've been feeling called toward, the, the more I can release my concerns about it, the more I can release the need to meticulously plan every aspect of it and just release into trust, like you're saying, the trust that my intuition is going to keep telling me that this is the right direction to be going. And, you know, intuition and flow are very closely interrelated. And I think that um, that is a, a major signpost pointing us to where we need to be going if if our intuition is when we can really tap into it uh if that is telling us yes keep going then really that i the point i've gotten to is if i can touch that and i can really feel that deeply then that's all i need i don't need these other affirmations from external sources because I can trust, I can know. Mm-hmm. Do you mind telling us a little bit about who you were as a, as a child and moving into how you found this path? Did you have an inkling that you were um, going to be such a bright light? I don't know. I mean, I, I felt very joyous as a child and, uh, and very free. My... I grew up, uh, my family owned a, an apple orchard. So I grew up kind of in that, that situation of, of just running free through the trees with my brother and with friends and feeling, you know, feeling very connected to, to that all and to nature. Um, and so that, that I think really set me up for, you know, versus I don't know what it's like to grow up in a city with all of the bustle and all of the noises and, you know, different energetic pulses and all of these different things that, you know, I live in a city now and that stuff affects me. (laughs) It's, it can be really difficult. It can be really distracting. And so I think my childhood having that, that joy, which I have always felt as a light in my heart and having that ability to just kind of disappear into nature, I think did set me up well for the exploring the psychedelic realms. Wow. And, um, did you have a particular experience where you found it and then you were like, wow, this is really something that I'm in love with. Did it take a while or? Uh, it, finding what, what particularly? Working with psychedelics and helping mm. people. I mean, for me, you know, kind of from first, first experience in my early 20s, um, I recognized that there was something here, something very different. And I never got into kind of um, utilizing these things to party, although it certainly wasn't doing the deeper spiritual work either. It was more, let's get a handful of friends together and go walk through the woods and eat some mushrooms. And look at how incredibly impressive this one tree is for two hours or, you know, and so 
I gained a lot of perspective from that and a lot of joy, but it wasn't until um, really for me, it was discovering Terrence McKenna and hearing him speak about it and hearing him say, the idea is to do it in darkness, in silence, and just lie there by yourself and experience the thing in itself. And that really awakened something in me of, Didn't wow, there's five grams. Wasn't that? Yeah. And oh. yeah, that was his five grams in silent darkness was his line. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, a lot. That's intense, especially being by yourself doing that. So did you do it? Oh, I've done that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there really is, you know, to me, I don't, put judgment on the different uh, approaches or the different modalities. I think it all, as long as you're treating it with respect and you understand what you're getting into, I think it, it all has a space. I think, you know, taking a couple grams of mushrooms and dancing to music in a big group of people can be a beautiful, ecstatic healing experience or you know, taking five grams by yourself with your eyes closed, it just, you get different things out of it. So if you're by yourself, then there's no social dynamic that's there at all. Even if you're, you have a guide sitting for you, there's still that part of your brain that's aware that, okay, I'm in a social situation. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're by yourself, the social dynamic is removed entirely from it. And then if your eyes are closed, the visual field is removed entirely from it. If you're in silence, the auditory field is removed entirely from it. And when you strip all that away, then, then, which is what Terrence said, you get to experience the thing in itself. Right. And that is, it's so profound that uh, I think it's with proper preparation and so on and so forth. I think it's worth exploring that. Wow. You were talking a little bit about, you know, the city noise. And my question is, is that it feels like, I don't know if it's what's happening with, you know, everything being in retrograde. It feels like there's a split with people that they're really resonating with high vibration things and then really having an intolerance for other things. So is that true with you? Is that you really know it's like you get guided in your everyday life. Like, this is for me. This is not for me. Is that what you're feeling? To some degree, certainly when I'm in tune, when I'm in touch with myself. Um, but I certainly fall prey to the so-called lower vibrational things too, and getting distracted and watching YouTube for hours and all of these other things that um, are kind of can be seen as an escape from the the spiritual work mm -hmm. and so i think it's a balance and i think i think one of the reasons that people are kind of exiting cities more and more so these days is because you know the more distractions you can remove from your field then the clearer your lenses are going to be and the clearer your lenses are going to be, then the better, you know, better human being you're going to be, the better you're going to treat yourself and others. And the more seriously you're going to take your serious work and the more joyfully you're going to participate in your play. And all of these things just, I think, become easier to step into authentically. Yeah. I love that you said that. Okay. So we're talking about in this great psychedelic Renaissance um, you know, people are kind of moving back out to, out of the city, but also we're in the midst of this great resignation where a lot of people are leaving their careers. So I think that is a, in line with what you said about clearing that lens. So we, while we're having this great resignation that on its own kind of derived from COVID, from, uh, you know, just the world, it's kind of separate from the psychedelic renaissance, but I think it's just going to add to it because people are really like, I don't know what is it feeling to you like people are like wow we only have one life to live you know yeah are we gonna buy into this story still 
Yeah, I think that's what's happening. I think people are fed up and with good reason. We're, the, the culture we're living in is intolerable. It really is. There's, it's like the consumer culture and the ways that there's so much division and so much hatred being thrown about and that fire being stoked and just all of it. It's intolerable. And people are fed up with it. And people, because you feel it, you, even if you're not intellectually aware of all of the things going on, and I'm certainly not, but you feel it inside, in your heart. You feel like this is not right. This is not what I'm meant to be doing. I would rather have to figure out how to make an income uh, than continue to work this job that's destroying me and, and sucking my soul. And, you know, I would rather go out and live in the woods and be maybe have less access to every kind of restaurant and all of my friends in order to escape the barrage of advertisements and noise and high rise apartment buildings and, you know, traffic and all of these other things that just wear on us. I think people are fed up and rightly so. And if we can channel that fed upness into creating the beautiful, the more beautiful world that we want to inhabit, then we're going to be just fine. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Slam dunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to tell us a little bit about the work you do? Yeah. What does it look like? And um, what type of people do you tend to um, work with? Yeah. So for me, it's really anyone who is ready to take the psychedelic work seriously, I am thrilled to work with because I take it really seriously. And to me, serious doesn't mean severe because there's joy in it as well. So I think it's joyous work, but it's also very serious Absolutely. because this is, you know, this is, like I said earlier, this is the work of life, integrating our ourselves, bringing our highest self into existence and psychedelics are such a great pathway into that. Um, so, you know, I, I have worked with people who have no experience at all, who are preparing for their first ceremony or people who have, you know, many ceremonies under their belt or journeys under their belt. And some people are still trying to make sense of and integrate an experience they had years ago. That's, that kind of surprised me that that's more common than I would have thought is that because a lot of people do, they have a psychedelic experience and they are alone or they're in an environment where it's not ideal. And especially, you know, the, the further you go into our recent past anyway, in, in this culture, um, when people were just experimenting and experimenting, now there's more and more kind of infrastructure being put in place. There's more understanding of the importance of a safe container. And of course, this is all ancient understandings as well that people have been practicing shamanically for millennia. So we're in this culture, we're kind of re-realizing it or relearning that the necessity of having kind of that that safe container, that, um, yeah, that ceremonial aspect to it. I think that aspect is really important. So yeah, for me, it's working with anyone who really wants to take it seriously and is taking their own healing and growth seriously and really wants to bring that out into the world as well, because that's one of my core understandings is that if each of us is able to release the things that we're holding on to that no longer serve us, that if each of us is able to heal to the extent that we can, 
from our past traumas um, and transcend those things, then that's how the world heals is by we, we all have to do our own work and then we go out into the world and we can become a, a presence of healing because we have healed. Wow, that's beautiful. So yeah, I really like how you talk about I'm, I'm ready and willing to work with people who are ready to take psychedelics seriously. Do you find a lot of people that I've spoken to find that most people will reach out and think that they want to connect and just not show up because it's just a not a leap that they can make? Do you have how are you able to get your clients to understand I'm totally available. I'd love to talk with you. And then how, how does the conversation go? Um, I want you to know what you're getting into. What does that look like? And, you know. Yeah. I mean, my, my um, I would say, highest precept that I put out there is to trust yourself. I tell people, trust yourself. You know what you need. And beautiful. You know, even we live in such a confusing world with so many distractions, and it's hard to discern even what is true and not anymore. Um, but I really believe at your core, in your heart, you know what you need. You know what you need. And if you can really tap into that, then you'll know when it's time to sit in an ayahuasca circle, or you'll know when it's time to start microdosing mushrooms, or you'll know that it's not time yet. You'll know that you have other work to do in, in the psychological domain before you're ready to get there. Um, so that's my kind of highest principle that I present to people is trust yourself. And my role isn't to tell you what to do, tell you what to believe, um, or tell you how you should approach these things. Although I can offer the understandings that I do have, I can offer the preparatory um, techniques that I have, the techniques for moving through a difficult experience when you're in it, and so on and so forth. But it's not my role nor really anyone's to say this is what you should do when you should do it how you should do it and what your belief system should be when you're doing it because each person knows each person knows what they need wow that's really beautiful yeah and um this mentor of mine who I adore her website is called the empowerment project. And, um, it's just a lot and totally in alignment. I think that's what it's teaching us is empowerment and that self-trust. That's, um, I really appreciate you clarifying that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think empowerment, encouragement, if we think about these, these terms, um, to encourage someone is to help them find courage to empower someone is to help them find power. And these things are within us all. We have our own power. We have our own courage and we just kind of have to delve through the, the dark forest of ourselves in order to, you know, pluck it out and look at it and put it on and inhabit it. But we all have it within ourselves. So that's, that's really I agree that that's kind of the the process is to empower and encourage to allow someone to find their own way to the courage, the power that they have inside them. Mm -hmm. So I'd really like to get on the record. I'm so curious about this. Um, sometimes there's, we go through things and let me give you an example. I know a woman who, you know, is a cancer survivor and it was really a rough journey. And so she'll really associate her identity with, I had cancer, I had cancer. And I was on the beach today and I saw a, a Vietnam uh, vet and I know because it was plastered all over himself, like his identity was that war. And I'm just curious about the, what you've seen through um, our ability to shed 
uh, identities that, you know, may not, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's just yeah. an interesting thing because then when you move into the psychedelic realm, it loosens the yes. attachment to those identities. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And this is something that Terrence McKenna would say as well, which is that the psychedelics allow us to shed our cultural clothing and to see ourselves as human beings. Wow. And I think that is one of the, the most powerful, one of the, the many, many most powerful aspects of the psychedelic medicines is that it allows us to tap into our humanness. And that's where the, that love, that interconnectionness, that recognition that each person is my brother, each person is my sister. Um, that's where you can really step into that because we, we have so much cultural clothing on and some of it we're aware of and we, we put on purposefully in the form of ideologies and some of it we aren't even aware that we're wearing in the form of cultural conditioning or just, you know, things we were told by our parents or by whomever. And yeah, going deep in a psychedelic journey, it just allows you to rip all of that clothing off and just dive into the pond and <laughs> feel your humanness and climb trees and, you know, do these things that, uh, so to speak, that um, truly allow our our deep humanness to shine without having to have these ideologies or these cultural conditionings telling us how to see ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a nurse and I've been a nurse for 15 years and I never realized, I never really looked at the experience of how conforming and, and I call it like there's this Barbie nurse persona where you look this size you know, you wear this jewelry, you post on social media just this much, not more. Um, this whole list of Barbie nurse criteria. And, um, and you don't shine the bright light. I actually had someone tell me, an authority figure at work say, your light is too bright, dim your light. Wow. And, um, you know, I am so grateful that I had that experience of the Barbie nurse because you know, now what I think, oh, well, am I nervous about where I'm taking my healing arts path? Or could I ever do that again? And it's like, I could, could never, could never, I will, that Barbie nurse has laid to rest. Yeah. <laughs> and then Good it's for like you. this barbar, almost a barbaric human <laughs> healer has emerged. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. From Barbie to barbarian. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's beautiful. And that's good for you for not allowing, there's so many aspects and I don't think it's with malicious intent. I think all of these things are momentum, but yeah. there's so many aspects of culture that just want to squish you into conformity that want to squish you into, you know, the perfect peg to fit into the perfect hole cog in the machine type of things right. and that's not who we are that's why people are are fed up because you can't tell people to dim their light their light is mm -hmm. who they are let your light shine bright and you know as long as there's there is no malice in your heart then it doesn't matter what you do right. you you trust yourself and you let your light shine bright um and the world is better off for it mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard somewhere that if an employer is telling you we're a family, we're a family to run because <laughs> <laughs> because it's part of that fitting into the cog um, because, it, you know, and anybody who's listening who's like maybe in that position, like if you tomorrow left that job, not one of those people are going to reach out to you. Um, they, they're your best friends because you're in that Um turning to who you really love is, is what will always matter on our last breath, on our last day. Um, you know, life is so short and I'm just, I've just been so grateful to have this conversation with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your networking and who are the great people that you get to stay in touch with? I mean, I 
I am fortunate to have. Because you're in uh, Oregon, right? So you have, yeah. you're located in a fantastic, in a fantastic state right now. Yeah. So I'm living in Portland, Oregon, and there's been so much movement recently in the psychedelic space of last year um, in 2020, two kind of major statutes passed where all substances, all drugs have been decriminalized and psilocybin therapy has been legalized. And they're going through the process right now of figuring out how to actually put that into place but it's it's amazing and so people out here are for the most part very open very transparent about where they stand and their work with psychedelics and i i am very much myself i think that it's part of my work is to wave the flag proudly um and so i i feel fortunate to have fallen into a community of people who take this very seriously and who, you know, treat it very joyously at the same time, but who are very serious about the psychedelic work and see the potential for healing. And from all different areas, um, people who, you know, work with um, producing medicine, people who our therapists who work with it and people who are just enthusiasts or, or spreading information and it, it takes all of that. And so, yeah, I feel very fortunate to have kind of fallen into a really supportive community where it's not rivalrous either, where I really believe there's enough space for everybody to step into this who wants to. And we don't need to step into a rivalrous position where, you know, I'm trying to be Walmart and you're trying to be Amazon. I think that's not, that's not, <laughs> that's against the the point of it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very supportive and it's very, again, taking it very seriously because this is serious and it's time. We don't have time to, to keep wasting or time to keep twiddling our thumbs the world is on fire and this psychedelic renaissance is happening now for a reason so it's time yeah and you know we weren't there we weren't alive in the 60s um and i'm curious if it felt this this beautiful if it felt like um I'm just curious in proportion because nothing can ever repeat itself exactly as it was. So it's interesting to feel this opening now, um, you know, I just as, a, as if a lotus flower and it's almost like it's happening on that, the original um, birth and death of the original Renaissance and the original yeah. research and the original <laughs> enthusiasm. So, um, you know, we don't always learn from history, but um, I sure hope that, that we're careful you know um, yeah yeah it seems that's the way that that's the way things are going and it seems that at least right now the government structures are recognizing to kind of step out of the way a little bit and let this unfold and the people are recognizing that we should do this properly so that the larger culture is open to it and not afraid of it and it seems like it, all of these things are happening, at least right now, in a really promising way. It was interesting to have the so much talk, so much obsession around the shutdown of uh, Facebook and Instagram yesterday. And then previous to that on NPR, there was a whole um, discussion about how bad Instagram is for our youth. And to me, it just felt so, such like a small and little conversation in comparison to the work we can be doing in reshaping our brains right now, you know? Um, it was almost like, it's almost like, wow, I, I just kind of feel sorry for people that they think that this conversation um, matters, you know? <laughs> I, hate, I hate to reduce it to that much, but it's like, like we've got um, some incredible momentum for healthy normals 
and um, people that are struggling. Yeah. And it's going to take, like I said, I think a lot of this stuff is just momentum that nobody is actually at the helm directing things. It's like Facebook doesn't understand what they're doing and with Facebook or Instagram or any of these things, they don't actually understand what they have. And there's a lot of just momentum, especially as algorithmic Uh equations are brought more and more into it. So I think the more that everybody can kind of be awakened and whether through psychedelics or, or other means, but certainly through psychedelics, then the people who are working on this infrastructure that we have can build into the infrastructure the the beauty and the love and the the healing so that each individual doesn't have to fight so hard just to reclaim their own mind and their own time beautiful yeah and there's a split there between you know the momentum that's happening with social media and the algorithms as you said and the momentum that's happening in the psychedelic field because there isn't a deeper algorithm that's pulling it it's almost like it's a it's a different consciousness the algorithm we develop is is a grain of sand in this huge beach of um you know stepping up into 